2020 trying to kill us pandemic uh, really hit, I went ahead and scanned the internet and took the top 10 countries with assets that uh, say hello to the internet. Um, and that's in the yellowish. Um, I'm not sure how much you can see because of the big DEF CON logo. And in the orangish um, bar, those are remote only um, access uh, protocols that I was looking for and also certain versions, like older versions of SSH, uh, FTP, remote desktop protocol, um, et cetera. So what I found was, for instance, the United States has 47,500,000 assets. Out of those assets, when I was looking only for known exploitable remote access vulnerabilities, uh, there were almost 12.5 million ones that I could find for the United States, which is not a great ratio. However, I will say that uh, some of the assets that I scanned, uh, they can have multiple vulnerabilities. Uh, Looking at between uh, the U.S. and China, uh, China has almost eight and a half million, but almost uh, assets on the internet that say hello, but almost five million of those are remotable with no uh, exploits and vulnerabilities in them. Uh, the one country that did fare uh, fairly well was actually the United Kingdom uh, with their ratio between assets and exploitable vulnerabilities. And one of the reasons for that was several years ago, uh, they did something uh, very fantastic. They instituted this thing, uh, uh, a cyber program uh, for anyone doing business with the UK and also critical infrastructure had to uh, really take a look at their stuff and go ahead and pass an, an audit, in most cases a self-audit, depending on your level of access with the government and also critical infrastructure. And they were able to get a head start and so they actually are doing fairly well in comparison to the rest of the top tenors. So another thing that we have to consider is because um, things are now industrial IoT devices or IoT devices, this means that you can have a control system uh, that is IoT enabled. Now in this case, um, I like to take a look at Tesla stuff because I just do. And uh, you can actually uh, use census.io, um, what I call census dork, to find various Tesla power walls. And uh, what's interesting about this is even though Tesla has some security, it's still single factor authentication. Uh, there's still a web interface. Uh, the customer doesn't necessarily have to set up any real security. So there's admin admin kind of stuff, uh, depending on the version of the software. Uh, Tesla does not force down updates like uh, Windows 10 or their cars. Uh, so there are a lot of old versions. And what you can uh, actually pull back is the configuration of the power walls, the versions, timestamps showing the last login, how long it's been up if it's updating or not, and a bevy of other diagnostic information. And uh, what's unfortunate is uh, if you're able to get into some of these systems, um, which uh, you can, um, you can uh, do more nefarious things. Uh, like imagine a region of power walls that suddenly all of their electricity got dumped on the uh, energy grid. That would be a very bad thing or if it was connected to some sort of crucial hardware, um, that would be a bad thing. And in this particular case, this one was uh, connected to a crane. Who doesn't want to own their own crane? Well, you can too. Um, so you have to understand that if it's running a web server, I don't care if it's, um, I don't know, power bank, or a piece of industrial equipment or whatever, you can hack it like a web server. Remember that. So um, I do a lot in aviation. Um, sometimes that's good, sometimes they hate me. So either way, you know. Um, so there are various ways to get into various things. And uh, one of the dangers that we have is a lot of remote desktop uh, protocol. You can actually buy exploited systems on the scary dark web um, from a dollar to $10 a piece 
if they have RDP, $10 is for typically US military assets that are found. In this case, uh, this one belongs to Airbus, where luckily the admin happens to be logged in. I wonder what the password might be. Uh, and the CN is actually the certificate, which I could match up to absolutely belonging to Airbus. Another fun fact is depending on the aircraft, some Airbus aircraft actually use Windows CE in their aircraft. Yay! So I'm not sure uh, you may or may not have heard much about Boeing other than some of their planes like to fall from the sky because they have software issues. And uh, starting last year, one of the things I did, uh, and by the way, hi Boeing, I know you still wanna put me in jail, um, was that I took a look around uh, some of their infrastructure and found that it was uh, incredibly bad. Um, for instance, at the time, uh, Boeing.com and its websites didn't even use HTTPS or any encryption for their websites. And this included login systems. Yay! Um, I was able to get into the R&D section of their flight control software, which also included the 737 MAX aircraft, uh, because to authenticate, I was using Firefox with no script running, and uh, the website had a message, you were ru not running scripts. Please press this bus button. Press the button. I was in. How awesome is that? Uh, there were, you know, six cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in the uh, live in production uh, flight control aviation ID system, Woo -hoo -hoo, right? And the interesting thing about this is if you can get into the flight control system or software um, and you know what you are doing, uh, the process is a technician will download what's needed for their aircraft, put it on a maintenance laptop, that maintenance laptop then plugs into the aircraft itself, uh, into the flight control system. Uh, so imagine some of the mayhem that you could do because Boeing had zero effort uh, and zero uh, knowledge in uh, security. Uh, funny enough, uh, they do sell cybersecurity services as consultants to the U.S. government. However, I guess they never ate their own dog food and looked at their own stuff. There were even hard-coded credentials in uh, an older version of SAML that you could easily decode. Um, the response from Boeing was, you're a criminal, um, harassment, uh, no bug bounty, um, and it was only after uh, my 59 page report went through and it got media attention after a disclosure period that uh, they were forced to start their first vulnerability disclosure program, um, which they said it was based on my report. However, as far as I'm aware, Boeing still gives zero uh, bug bounty awards. So agriculture is nice because I think all of us like to eat and um, this is an instance where it's a control system that is now an industrial IoT system that is hanging on the internet uh, that has a web server that has never been security tested with no authentication. And it happens to be a European um, a fish farm, a salmon farm to be exact. And uh, you can actually um, in real life like press the buttons and uh, you can modify the operations of this. So we like water. Uh, Mexichem is actually a major uh, bottled water uh, provider, manufacturer, amongst other things uh, in Latin America and South Africa. They do a, a lot of stuff. So um, I was looking around because I get curious and bored and I was very quickly able to uh, find, uh, because they allowed LDAP, uh, to be exposed to the internet. Uh, I found 24 pages of assets uh, from the IT side on the business level, all the way down to on the control level for their Windows-based uh, SCADA systems. And this was rather unfortunate uh, because um, some of the systems that I was able to find was this wonderful, uh, what's called HMI, Human Machine Interface, uh, the same exact version that was vulnerable to some of the black energy attacks. And um, you didn't actually have to log in because it was never set up correctly. 
Um, I could access the drives that it was attached to. I could import and delete uh, recipes, which is actually the, uh, the production recipe of what the machinery will be doing. And I could just click as many buttons as I wanted to. I could even export the administration data all at the touch of my fingertips from my comfortable small Amsterdam house. And uh, Mexichem also produces uh, various different types of chemicals, some of which are more controlled uh, so that they don't fall in the hands of uh, really bad people who want to make things go boom. So another thing to consider is um, we're talking about IoT systems. They can be uh, anywhere. Uh, they could be inside a hospital, they could be on sensitive networks, they could be at nuclear physics labs in Russia, um, and uh, they, they could also be inside uh, control systems uh, so that you can actually, you know, use a printer. And um, so I was able to uh, have a bit of fun um, Again, being bored, don't ever let me get bored, and uh, use uh, census and a few other uh, scanning tools to quickly find as many uh, particular printers as possible. Um, it, it stemmed from the fact I was having a problem with my printer, and I downloaded the uh, Brother Admin tool, which covers almost all of their models, and I noticed that it had never been security tested. So I went ahead and flipped it around and turned it into a dual use weaponized uh, piece of admin tool. And a lot of these printers will have web interfaces. So I had a lot of fun with cross-site scripting, but most of my fun came from using the admin tool. See, once you find one of these printers, it's not that difficult to find, you can use the free brother admin tool Go ahead and put in the IP address and then connect to somebody else's printer anywhere in the world. You can see how much ink they have. You can even order if it's set up in their printer um, ink and toner supplies because, hey, toner's worth more than platinum. Um, and you can also send files directly to the printer. Um, so I had a lot of fun with this. Um, but uh, unfortunately, Brother, like most printer manufacturers, do not have a vulnerability disclosure program, nor did they ever think that you could use this lovely free tool available now to download and you can weaponize it and really make uh, printers' lives uncomfortable. Uh, bonus item, if it's a multifunctional printer that's more of the commercial variety that has a hard drive installed and say human resources uses it as a scanner for different types of identification systems, you can even access the hard drive where it saves those scans and get all sorts of personally identifiable information and health data just by using this tool. So I like space and uh, one of the things that is a bit problematic is uh, just like uh, regular industrial systems, once you put something in space, it's expected to last a while. There's even a space satellite that uh, is in a very interesting um, orbit uh, that is up there for over 50 years. There's a lot of legacy stuff. Um, once you put something up there, it's not like you can go, hey, guess what? We've got this new type of encryption. You know what? It needs a chip to be able to process it. We're just going to replace that chip in the satellite. That doesn't happen. Um, and what we did last year was in the United Kingdom, uh, thanks to Oxford, who funded it, and de Montfort University, we held the first space hackathon at Royal Holloway University uh, to discuss these things with uh, cleared PhD students who were given uh, a lot of information by myself and others on uh, some of the problems with current and new space assets uh, because they're really industrial IoT devices and uh, how to uh, combat some of those problems because encryption might not be there. I believe it was only uh, the year before last that the FTC mandated that new space asset actually had to have the ability to use encryption. And we've seen some satellite systems being used in various cyber crime 
uh, attacks and malware because if you can um, put one of your hops and traceability on a satellite, it kind of makes it a bit hard to see who's actually behind different things. So a lot of cool stuff came out of this hackathon. PhD students were absolutely fantastic and energetic. Uh, they listed a lot of um, very pertinent risks that we had to consider, such as um, the current uh, UN space treaties do not cover private companies when it comes to warfare. Uh, it only covers uh, nation states. And the fact that uh, some major players in the market, um, if you want to watch a great uh, older movie, I believe it's called Moonraker, it's a James Bond movie, where a really rich guy with way too much money um, decides to go into space and then try to take over the world by going to war in space as a private company. And so uh, some of the uh, risks listed uh, were, for example, um, Elon Musk and his program, because anyone can turn evil. And he already thinks that uh, the pyramids were created by aliens. So uh, to give a brief example, you can actually find some of these systems. Uh, now, there's uh, different ways that you can find various space IoT systems. A lot of them you'll find are actually land systems that then communicate up, but those land systems, uh, they can actually unfortunately be hacked. Uh, in this particular case, I was able to find a relay uh, connection up to a satellite. And uh, I didn't want to give away too much information because they have not gotten back to me. Um, I was able to find this particular device was running my favorite protocol Modbus with no authentication. It could give the device ID, function codes, and all sorts of information about it. And by looking into uh, various user manuals that are freely available, I was able to find that it was called a sunny string monitor that was attached to the satellite. And what it does is it looks for a uh, sun and uh, goes ahead and opens a solar array on a satellite system to give a power or closes it down uh, when uh, there's nothing available or can move it around a little bit. So imagine what you could do with that. So why is this kind of important? Uh, last month, uh, the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research asked me to give a presentation, a closed dialogue session to permanent member states uh, with other member states as observers. And I brought up the fact that um, we need to be a lot more proactive. And uh, although the United Nations in 2015 established that member states are uh, responsible for securing their ICT cyberspace, that also includes space assets, that also includes industrial systems, et cetera. Um, they uh, agreed to establish a computer emergency response team, and that's well and good, it's fantastic, it's much needed, but uh, that also is very, very reactive and constantly are putting out fires. So it's very difficult for you to be proactive. So uh, I brought up with them that I'm currently working with part of the European Union to uh, actually establish their first proactive computer emergency protection team, a SEPT. And CERT step one, SEPT step two, um, to try to alleviate some of the burden and also try to catch things as quickly as possible before they become major incidents. Um, now, back in 2009, this is also another reason why it's kind of important is I detected a cyber warfare attack, the second wave of such attacks uh, caused by malware that the North Koreans created. One of the things they did was they leveraged higher speed bandwidth in Northern Europe uh, to go ahead and have those various devices aim at the South Korean uh, infrastructure and also part of the infrastructure of the United States. So they attacked the South Korean version of the White House and also the US version of the White House. Uh, they tried to affect uh, the New York Stock Exchange and a lot of other uh, very important places. And because um, we were also monitoring in my uh, shop ICS uh, systems that had internet connectivity. Uh, we found that some of the Windows-based stuff uh, actually uh, was also affected and was uh, trying to take down part of South Korea and the US. So uh, you can actually, unfortunately, weaponize with various types of malware, IT, IoT, and ICS, as we keep seeing. But even in 2009, 11 years ago, 
uh, we were seeing this type of stuff. So we need to take it much more seriously with the vendors, um, as well as the critical infrastructure operators and get the tech community involved because academia is great. Uh, government experts are fantastic, but it's us and you watching this that have that uh, hacker mentality and can actually uh, express it and find ways in and out that others can't. So uh, with that, I will be available on Discord for questions. Um, hopefully I get the right Discord channel. I uh, wanted to give a huge shout out to Omar, uh, at Santo Omar and the Red Team Village for inviting me. Uh, if you also would like to contact me about things that are going on in the Middle East, uh, I believe my contact information is now on the Middle East Institute's uh, website. And feel free to contact me on Twitter and I take DMs just no weird pictures no weird sexy time pictures let me stress that i love pictures of cats so thank you very very much red team village it is greatly appreciated thank you so much for supporting us and for the great presentation you're getting a lot of kudos in discord so talking about discord if you're joining us you know you can see the link in the bottom of the screen there's a link to a website where um, you know it has a, a lot of other information about the speakers along with you know all the activities that are happening in, of course, in DEF CON. So with that said, we're going to go in a break for a few minutes, and then the next presentation will be up uh, in probably about 15 to 20 minutes. So thank you again, Chris. Thank Great you. presentation. Have a nice one. All right, cheers. <laughs>